thank you for joining us in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we normally uh, uh, have this ceremony uh, in Venice, and I don't mean Venice, California, uh, but it is a very nice change of pace for us to be with you here on this beautiful campus in this beautiful city, and so thank you for coming. We have many storm clouds that are gathered in our world. Some of them have broken already and are raging, whether it's in Ukraine or Israel and the Palestinian territories and Sudan and so many other places in the world. But the Aurora humanitarians to whom you will be introduced today uh, are doing us a special service, that of, that of preventing us from, from falling into despair. Because by the very fact of their work and the recognition that we expect to bestow on them today, they tell us that there is a way forward to make progress in the world. And so we thank them as we thank you for coming. And good morning, everyone. I just want to join my colleague, Dele, in welcoming you all warmly. What an inspiring day to gather together with this amazing group of humanitarians and human rights defenders here in California for the very first time. The Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA Law is thrilled to co-host for the award of the Aurora Prize and Aurora's prestigious events this week. And our involvement in today's activities is really a poignant reminder of the vital role that top educational institutions play in the global human rights landscape through thought leadership and training the next generation of humanitarians and human rights defenders. By hosting the Aurora Prize here, we connect California's reputation as a leader in social justice movements with global efforts to come alongside and support those who are having significant human rights and humanitarian impact so critical for our world today. So as we proceed with today's tribute to the 2024 Aurora Humanitarians, let's use this time together to renew our own commitment to human rights and draw strength from the extraordinary example and contributions of our honorees. Their stories that you will hear today will motivate us and the Promise Institute to never give up in pursuit of justice and equality for all. Thank you again for joining us for this momentous occasion. And it's my pleasure to be here as Executive Director of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative on behalf of the whole team. Thank you again uh, for being here with us. And thank you both for sharing the stage. We're here today to celebrate some of humanity's best. You're gonna see in a few minutes some of their stories and I hope, as you, you heard just now in a couple of the conversations earlier, you consider the fact that these are just everyday people. There are many folks who have been Aurora Humanitarians in the past here with us today. I encourage you to speak with them. The moment that we deify or distance ourselves, we let ourselves off the hook and we all have a responsibility. Now, I have the pleasure of inviting to the stage Lord Aradarzi, Chairman of the Aurora Selection Committee and Co-Director of the Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College London. Please join me in welcoming him as he will share more about the remarkable contributions of our nominees. Thank you, Armin. Let me firstly start by acknowledging Nubara Fayan, our founder, and also some of our founders who are not with us today. And also to thank Eric Israelian for his leadership in bringing this amazing meeting between the Promise Institute, but also with Aurora. And finally, for Mr. Milken, for his leadership and the tremendous contribution he's made in his life and his career and what we learned from him. And more importantly, our distinguished panel, the panel who have the most difficult task in choosing our uh, laureates, which is not an easy task, I could tell you, and I'm looking forward to the meeting later on uh, today. As you know, every year we come together for a singular purpose, to pay tribute to the sacrifices made by extraordinary individuals across the globe. We are deeply moved 
by the remarkable people who put themselves forward for, the, for this prize. A prize that not only recognizes their deeds, but also acknowledges the immense hardship faced worldwide, especially during the times we are all navigating through as we speak. The task of Aurora is a complex one. On one hand, we celebrate heroes, and on the other hand, we emphasize that our humanitarians are just regular people who have chosen to do what many of us only witness in films and documentaries. During the Aurora Prize events, we do more than just to shine a spotlight on these extraordinary individuals. We create a platform for them to connect, share, and to draw strength from one to the other. It is through this network of support and solidarity that we hope to amplify their impact and inspire others to join this cause. In the 2024 Aurora Prize cycle, we received 732 nominations from 75 countries supporting 675 candidates. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to both the Aurora Prize expert panel and the selection committee members for their exceptional assessment work. It takes hours of work to select our laureates. And choosing just one recipient from hundreds of remarkable stories we encounter each year is not an easy task. And the challenge only grows with each year. As we reflect on the power of individual commitments to humanitarian ideals, we are reminded of the courage and resilience displayed by those who confront adversity with hope and determination. I extend my heartfelt thanks to Abdul Hadi, Nasreen, and Dennis, and I warmly welcome them to the Aurora family. Thank you, Armin, and enjoy the celebrations later on this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Dazi, uh, for your remarkable leadership, uh, which I have experienced uh, firsthand and at close quarters. And now I'd like to introduce our first 2024 Aurora Humanitarian. I'd like to call to the stage uh, the son of the late uh, Aurora co-founder Vata Gregorian, uh, Mr. Rafi Gregorian, a seasoned diplomat both at the U.S. Department of State, at NATO, and at the United Nations, who has now recently joined the board of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative. Um, please welcome the former U.S. Navy veteran, Rafi Gregory. Thank you, Dele, and good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, taking a page from my uh, diplomatic past, I'll just say all, pro all protocols observed. So I can't uh, go through all the extremely <coughs> prestigious um, gathering that we have here uh, of, of donors, of laureates, and so on. So uh, it is my honor to uh, uh, present to you uh, Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja. He's the Danish Bahrainian human rights and political activist who has been fearlessly advocating for human rights and political freedom in Bahrain and across the Middle East and North Africa since the late 1970s. His family harassed and facing torture back home for his human rights advocacy as a university student in London. Abdul Hadi was forced into exile until Denmark granted him political asylum in 1991. Then, together with other Bahraini and regional human rights defenders, Abdul Hadi co-founded several prominent human rights organizations, such as the Bahrain Center for Human Rights in 2001 and the Gulf Center for Human Rights in 2011. 
These organizations were the first of their kind in the region. They helped ignite a powerful culture of peaceful resistance against authoritarian regimes and contributed to the political changes that took place in Bahrain when the new ruler came to power in 1999. Abdul Hadi returned to Bahrain in 2001 under a general amnesty and resumed his peaceful struggle to promote human rights. He spoke out against the regime's human rights abuses and advocated for economic equity and an end to corruption in Bahrain, for which he was arrested several times. But in 2011, during the short-lived Bahrain chapter of the Arab Spring uprisings, Abdul Hadi led several peaceful demonstrations demanding democratic reforms. He was arrested again in April 2011, right after he had publicly criticized the regime's brutal response to the anti-government protests in Bahrain. On that occasion, at least 15 masked men stormed into Abdul Hadi's apartment and beat him until he lost consciousness. He was then taken into custody, tortured, and held incommunicado for several weeks. Despite the flimsy evidence against him and a lack of due process, Abdul Hadi was convicted of participating in terrorism to overthrow the government, as well as spying for a foreign country and sentenced to life imprisonment. Subjected to torture and deprived of adequate medical care for much of his 13 years in prison, Abdul Hadi has resorted several times to hunger strikes. His health has significantly deteriorated and is he, a, he is in dire need of medical attention. Yet despite the violence and indignities to which he has been subjected for more than a decade, Abdul Hadi remains committed to nonviolent protest and human rights advocacy. The repeated abuses that Abdul Hadi has endured violate the human rights obligations the government itself consented to when it signed the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the International Convention for Civil and Political Rights, the very ones for which Abdul Hadi has been fighting. In the age of impunity, as we hope, hope from Farid Zakaria, it is past time for the government to act in accordance with its legal obligations and release all those who are wrongfully held. With that, ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the screen as we unveil a short documentary that captures the unwavering spirit of Abdul Hadi al Khawaja. This film will illuminate his relentless pursuit of human rights and the profound influence his inspiring actions have had across the region. My father's name is Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja. As his daughters and as his family, we try to be his voice. My father was arrested in 2011 and sentenced to life in prison in Bahrain. If you go there, you'd think it's pretty quiet and a very touristy country. The government spends so much money to make Bahrain look like something that it's not. We live under a monarchy that looks at us not as full human beings, but as subjects. Fear. Fear is a, a real, real problem. Everybody is criticizing the Prime Minister by the Republic. So we thought if we took that step, the people will start speaking about what they know. My dad actually left Bahrain as a student to go study, and he was studying law at the time. But then he left that to work full time on the Bahraini case and cause and human rights um, in Bahrain. Because he was doing that work, he was not allowed to go back to Bahrain. It was dangerous for him to get imprisoned. We went back to Bahrain in 2001. There was a general amnesty and all the people who were wanted in Bahrain for being activists were allowed to return. But then my father was very active in Bahrain and he started a human rights organization there. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
My father he was called the godfather of human rights in the region. He wasn't just sitting in a room telling people, these are your rights. He would actually go out and do things. In 2011, Arab Spring happened and the revolution started in Bahrain. Everyone was waiting for that chance to actually get out and speak out. We're brothers and sisters, as Sunni, as Shia, as communists. We're all here demanding basic human rights. With the Gulf armies, with the Saudi army, the government attacked the Pearl Roundabout. I saw a lot of the bodies of protesters who've been killed. By doing this, the government in Bahrain has taught the people of Bahrain that speaking up means you pay a price that is so high. I would prefer that always been for the people's rights, not for me personally. But sometimes you need to sacrifice to get your rights. It's been 13 years out of the life sentence that my father was handed for basically being a human rights activist. And till today, my father is still suffering from months of torture that he was subjected to. My father has a broken jaw. He still has more than 27 metal plates holding his jaw together. My father also was hit a lot around his body, so he would literally not be able to sleep because everything hurts. At one point, my father stopped being able to see with one of his eyes. The most scared we ever were was when he started having problems with his heart. They were refusing to take him to hospital because they want to punish him. After being tortured for that long, somebody came and said, I'm here representing the King of Bahrain. If you're willing to apologize to the King right now on camera, the torture will stop. If not, we're gonna continue torturing you and you're gonna get raped. And then my father said no. I haven't seen my father for seven years. Even my family who's in Bahrain, my sister and my mom also don't see him for years. The phone calls is all we got. Dear friends, I am now honored to invite to the stage uh, Abdulhadi Al Khawaja's representative and longtime supporter, Khalid Ibrahim, co founder together with Abdulhadi and executive director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights, which provides support and protection to human rights defenders. Please join me in welcoming uh, Khalid. I have the honor of kicking us off with some questions. Oh. I'm ready. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Could you share with us what impact you think Abdulhadi's activism has had on Bahraini civil society? And could you also comment on his prospects for release okay. from the life sentence? Well, I start by thanking the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative and the Promise Institute for Human Rights to thank all the staff and volunteers to thank you all for your support. And really, I am honored to represent my colleague, Abdul Hadi, and his respected family. Now, the impact of Abdul Hadi, my colleague, in actual fact, he is the one who initiated the human rights movement in Bahrain. And he is, as an international human rights figure, he really put everything 
to achieve his goal, freedom for all people in Bahrain. With a country that have massive human rights violations, you need a system, you need people to document violations. So he established the Bahrain Center for Human Rights in 22, and he created a, a new generation of young human rights defenders to do that job, to document violations. And he taught them to be peaceful and to stand up for, for people's rights. All of them, they are still, some, some of them inside Bahrain, and they always, they think about the impact of Abdul Hadi. He's, I could say, the leader of a human rights movement in Bahrain. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. So having worked so closely with Abdul Hadi, uh, what personal stories about him do you remember that could give us some uh, essential understanding of his character? Quickly, briefly, I know the time is limited. I have three stories. The first story, it was 2011. We both working for a few frontline defenders. Me in Dublin and uh, Abdel Hadi in Bahrain and moving around in MENA. He is not uh, limited to work for human rights just in Bahrain, but the whole MENA region. Now, the founder of uh, Frontline Defenders is Mary Lawler, the current UN rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders. So we were working with her. One day I got a call. It was February 2011. Hello, Abdul Hadi, just like that. I told him, Khalid, I resigned from Frontline Defenders. I told him, Abdul Hadi, you didn't discuss that with me. And look what he told me. Khalid, there is no time for discussion. I have to be with my people. There is an uprising in Bahrain. That, that was, a, I was a speechless, a very strong uh, uh, statement. He left everything, a luxury job, a well-paid job, living in Dublin, the capital of Ireland, the country of the thousand welcomes, or going to Copenhagen, he has a Danish passport. He left all that to defend freedom. The second story, just very quickly, he was uh, before the military court, a court that lacked all the international standards for uh, fair trial and uh, due process. And the judge told him, Abdel Hadi, I sentence you to life in the prison. The, 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 the court is full with uh, armed guards. Abdel Hadi stood up and said, I will continue working for human rights. <laughs> I will continue working for human rights. That is Abdel Hadi. It is just something that it is in his uh, nature, uh, in his genes to defend human rights anywhere. It is him who said the prison is not going to end my human rights. And he went through seven hunger strikes, defending the rights of himself and his colleagues. The third story is very quickly. We were in Bahrain on a human rights mission in 2009. We met Nisreen, Nisreen Satouda, Abdel Hadi and Nisreen and myself. And we agreed to cooperate. After a few years, they both went to prison. And then I went back to Tehran, Abdel Hadi in the prison, but uh, Nisreen, my colleague Nisreen, uh, was released from one of the, her several detentions. I met her and I t she told me, Khalid, these are a few prison made gifts, please deliver them to Abdel Hadi. And I did that through the family. And I am saying this story to tell you that we are united in our goal. We want the freedom to Iran, to Bahrain, to uh, uh, Democratic Congo, and elsewhere, anywhere in this globe. Yes. Thank you for that, Halid. In light of his incredible commitment and courage to human rights, I'm wondering if you can share a bit more uh, about the Gulf Center for Human yes. Rights and how it's carrying on Halid's legacy. Yes. Or sorry, excuse me, Abdul Hadi. Yes, well, it is not a secret. We have our communications through the family with Abdul Hadi. I managed, it was very painful, I managed to talk to him through one of these calls that are allowed. And always uh, he's very serious about having uh, the organization, the Gulf Center for Human Rights, working purely for human rights, without any hidden agenda, without any political 
goals. Only use the UN terminology and defend human rights. And then he also uh, thought that we have to work in the whole MENA region, not just the Gulf countries and the neighboring countries to the Gulf countries. So now we are working in the whole MENA region. And he, as you know, there's no uh, remedy in our country. So if you have a, a complaint about human rights violation, where to go? There is nowhere to go. And he stressed on the need to use the international mechanisms, including the UN system. And thankfully, we are very closely working with the whole uh, uh, mechanism of the UN and other mechanisms uh, trying to have a peaceful change in our countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Khalid, for your time with us this I morning. It's our hope that uh, this uh, event today and many others like it would hasten the time when uh, uh, Abdul Hadi is released from uh, prison. Thank you again. It's now my honor to invite Dame Louise Richardson, my fellow member of the selection committee, to introduce our next uh, Aurora humanitarian. Good morning. I'm sure like uh, everyone here, you're feeling the sense of awe of the, uh, the bravery, the fortitude of those we're honoring this morning. And my task is to introduce Nazarene Suteda, who is an extraordinarily brave, principled, and inspiring woman. She is an Iranian lawyer who advocates tirelessly for the rule of law and depend, defends the rights of vulnerable groups in the face of Iran's repressive regime. From political prisoners to opposition activists, children, and women, including those arrested for protesting compulsory headscarves. Nazrin is the co-founder of the Professional Women Lawyers Association and the Children's Rights Committee. She also co-founded a campaign to abolish the death penalty in Iran, known as Step by Step to, to Stop the Death Penalty. Due to her unrelenting commitment to justice, Nazrin has frequently been imprisoned and kept in solitary confinement since 2010. Most recently, in 2018, she was convicted in absentia for charges including propaganda against the state, assembly and collusion, and espionage, and sentenced to five years in prison. Then in December 2018, she was again tried in absentia for additional charges, including encouraging corruption and prostitution. And in March 2019, was sentenced to 38 years in prison and 148 lashes. Due to significant deterioration of her health, following a 46-day hunger strike in 2010, Nazrin was granted several medical furloughs, the most recent of which continues. Last October, Nazrin was arrested again and severely beaten for violating hijab rules and acting against the psychological security of society. She was released two weeks later, but is still under a travel ban with her bank account frozen and facing additional charges for opposition to Iran's mandatory hijab laws. She remains uncowed. Now I'd like to invite you to turn your eyes to the screen as we present a brief documentary showcasing the courageous efforts of Nazreen Sutada. This film highlights her dedication to justice and the significant changes she has catalyzed. Let's watch it together. فکر میکنم حدود پنج تا پر نه بیشتر بود حدود هشت تا پرونده ادام داشتم که خوشبختانه تونستم جلوی ادام رو بگیرم چه ادام زیر اشده سال بود چه ادام سیاسی بود
من از اینکه وضعیت قانون و عدالت تو جامعه ما روز به روز بدتر میشه میترسم میترسم که از اینه که هست بازم بدتر بشه این خیلی ترس بزرگی تو من. قلمان یه زن ایرانی من میخوام که مثل هم همه ی انسان ها تمام حقوقی که برای زندگی لازمه مثل همه زنان دنیا و مثل همه مردان دنیا داشته باشیم ما هم در ایران داشته باشیم امروز خبردار شدیم که توی زندان برای نسرین حکم شو ابلاغ کردن 38 سال و نیم در مجموع بهش حکم دادن حکم زندان 148 در بشلا من میتونم برم زندان رو تحمل کنم ولی وقتی که نمیتونم کار کنم احساس میکنم دست و پای من اینجوری بسته شده و همین که این در باقی من خوب تلیزایی حسن هم دو تا بچه ها رای مدیدیم The situation becomes more dire for Nasrin for today. She's on a dry hunger strike. That means she's not eating and she's not drinking any water. Today. Nasreen Sotudeh, welcome and congratulations on being free. How do you feel? I'm free from prison today and I, I'm glad. من هیچ تعهدی شفاهی یا کتبی ندادم در واقع به دلیل ناراحتی قلبی که داشتم به دلایل درمانی بیرون هستم و ولی مشکل اینه که اجازه کار به من نمیدن فقط اونه ولی نه هیچ تعهدی ندادم که صحبت نکنم حرف نزنم نه هیچ کدوم Nasrin strength and courage and indefatigability shine through and they're truly inspiring. We are now going to try to establish a live video connection to hear from Nasreen herself. We welcome you uh, to Los Angeles, Nasreen, uh, if only virtually. Thank you for being with us. I'd like to invite um, 
Jeff Kaufman and Mattia Ross, who are the talented producers of the documentary called Nazarene, which has played a crucial role in spreading uh, the work of Nazarene throughout the world, as well as all our struggles. So welcome to Jeff. Uh, thank you to the Aurora Prize and the Promise Institute and to all the incredibly remarkable people here who are fighting for democracy and human rights. This is, this is a great honor and on behalf of uh, Nazrin Suta and her, and her remarkable family, we say thank you very much and merci. Nasreen, hello. I'm Hannah Gary. I'm at the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA Law School. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so inspired by your commitment to justice, and we know that it has come at great personal cost. We're wondering if you could share a bit with us about what keeps you resilient and determined in the face of such significant challenges. من سلام می کنم به همه شما که اونجا هستید به رئیس بنیاد اورورا Hello everyone I am so glad to be here Hello um, to the founders of Aurora to the directors to the staff to all the friends to help to everyone who brings this event together Hello to all my friends from Iran from America from the other parts of the world who have joined us today. Um, we are all human when, and we all share the same fate. And I'm so honored that our um, pain and our common cause has brought us together. Before I answer your question, I want to thank Jeff and Marsha from the bottom of my heart for being um, uh, invaluable friends to my family for a, for a long, long time. I mean, not only me, but my daughter, who was always by my side during my um, fight for democracy. Um, and now um, she's um, abroad for studies, and I know that Jeff and Marsha um, are um, going to host her soon. Um, but to answer your question, um, to be honest, I really don't know where I get my strength. And um, actually, I have to tell you, given what we endure, I would say that I need even more strength than what I have. Because when you look at um, some of the reasons that we have to um, endure such pain, um, ridiculous things like um, deciding what to wear or if you can drink alcohol or not, um, I realize that um, I need to be um, stronger. Beyond the legal um, tactics and strategies that you use in conducting this fight. What cultural changes do you believe are necessary to entrench uh, human rights in Iran and across the globe? The most um, important cultural understanding and change that we need, um, well, of course, in Iran, but um, other places too, is um, to know and to realize that every time we learn about a new right, for example, if we study the United Nations Declaration of Rights and we learn that everyone has the right to practice their religion, we immediately have to want that right for others. So, um, for example, I immediately have to turn my attention towards religious minorities and want that freedom of religions for them. Um, once we do that, automatically um, we will also get um, the, the, um, what we want and the respect that, that I want individually. That would automatically come. Nasreen, yours is work that echoes through generations and so what advice would you have to someone in a younger generation looking to pick up the mantle to become involved in human rights advocacy? 
Um, well, unlike other people, and unlike many who say it's a long, hard, difficult journey, I'm actually going to say no. It's not at all, because there is nothing in this world uh, more difficult than enduring oppression and injustice. So when young people come to me and ask me, ask me for advice, I always say um, the exact place, the exact moment that you want to give up, and because it's gotten so difficult for you, don't stop, because that's where actually the end is and the, the freedom, the victory comes. Thank you so much for that, Nasreen. Your unwavering <clears throat> commitment and resilience you, and fight for justice is such an inspiration to all of us. And we're so grateful that you have joined us today. I just want to invite you to uh, close with any remarks. And we are so sorry that we, we have to, to close this conversation with you. But we send you, our hearts are with you, and we send you all of our best wishes and thoughts as you continue on the fight. Um, I don't have anything special to say. I just want to say that I am so honored to be here with the other two nominees, and I truly believe that they have been working harder and longer than I have, and they deserve this prize more than I do. Um, I also wanted to say I'm just so happy that I got to see Khaled Ibrahim. Um, do you see how small the world is and how we are all connected in our fight for, for freedom? Um, I'm just so glad and so honored that um, this has brought us together here today. Thank you so much, Nasreen. The honor is ours. So now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce or to invite to the stage uh, Leima Bawi, an esteemed member of the Aurora Prize Selection Committee and Nobel Peace Prize laureate to introduce our third 2024 Aurora humanitarian, Dr. Dennis McQuege, whose dedicated service has profoundly impacted so many lives. Please join me in welcoming Leima. Thank you. In 2014, a young girl was found by the roadside in Congo. She looked 12. She was actually 22. She had been repeatedly raped in a mine, left to die by the roadside. Today, she lives in Congo. She's doing very well, thriving. And all of this is because in 1999, an amazing gynecological doctor decided to work for Congolese women that have been subjected to wartime sexual and gender-based violence by providing them medical treatment as well as psychosocial, socioeconomic, and legal support. Dr. Dennis Maguege and his team set up the Pansy Hospital to change their lives, and they've been doing that of over 80,000 women. Dr. Mogwege is a leading advocate for the elimination of rape as a weapon of war in his personal capacity and as an advisory committee member of the international campaign to stop rape and gender-based violence. In 2012, his home was violently attacked. His family was held at gunpoint in an assassination attempt after he openly denounced the country's 16 years long conflict and call for those responsible to be brought back to justice during a speech at the United Nations. After the attack, Dr. Mugwege fled the country. The story did not end with him fleeing. The beautiful end to that story is that women, community women that he had helped, came together, sold vegetables, put money together, and decided you're our son and you are coming back home. Dr. McGregor returned, vowing to continue to serve survivor despite the rapes to his own safety. In 2018, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his effort to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict. In 2023, 
determined to do everything to end the ongoing armed conflict in DR Congo and to protect and empower people affected by it, he ran for the presidential election. Dr. Magwege has been doing amazing work for the people of Congo. Now let's take a moment to witness the remarkable journey of someone I love to call my friend and my brother, Dennis Magwege. Nous, nous vivons ces chaos depuis euh, 1996. Ça nous donne cette impression que c'est une guerre éternelle. La population congolaise, la plupart aujourd'hui, sont nés dans la guerre. Ils ont grandi dans la violence et ils ne connaissent qu'une chose, la violence. Les rebelles prennent les filles, les enfants, les femmes comme des butins de guerre. En fait, je crois que ce qui se passe au nord qui vous est un itori est d'abord insupportable. Nous pouvons constater que aujourd'hui, le nombre de victimes de violences sexuelles augmente. Quand j'ai fait dix ans au bloc opératoire, j'ai commencé à me rendre compte que mon travail au bloc n'était pas suffisant. Seule la lutte contre l'impunité peut briser la spirale des violences. Il n'y aura pas de paix ni développement économique et social sans respect des droits de l'homme. Il n'y a pas de paix durable, sans justice. Qui permet la mise en œuvre de la justice C'est l'État. J'accepte donc d'être votre candidat à la présidence de la République. Et donc, je voulais absolument pouvoir faire tout ce que je pouvais faire. J'ai posé ma candidature. Je n'étais pas naïf. Je savais qu'il y aura la fraude. Mais pour moi, c'était important d'y aller malgré pour tout simplement soutenir la population et responsabiliser aussi la population. Je trouve toujours l'inspiration dans le femmes que je soigne et que je respecte beaucoup pour toute l'inspiration qu'elle me donne. Quand les femmes se battent, elles ne se battent pour, pas pour elles-mêmes. Elles se battent aussi pour le droit de leurs enfants, pour le droit de leurs maris, pour le droit de leur communauté. Et je pense que cet esprit qui domine les femmes, c'est ça l'esprit qui devrait dominer 
notre monde d'aujourd'hui, nous devons continuer à nous battre pour tout simplement dire la guerre n'est pas une option. Dr. McQuaggy, your work and dedication to healing the people of your country is nothing short of inspirational. And so I invite everyone here in honor of Abdul Hadi, of Nasrin, and of Dr. McQuaggy, who's going to come up in a moment, to please let's rise in ovation. Dr. McQuaggy, you're so inspirational. Thank you for joining us today and being with us. And you've been at the forefront of treating victims of grave violations of human rights, international crimes, crimes of sexual violence for a number of years now. So can you share with us a bit about what keeps you motivated and committed to this emotionally taxing work? Thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank the Aurora Initiative for just taking this cause because I think that the crisis in Congo is the most forgotten and neglected. And to be here today is just for us to say you don't forget the Congolese people who are suffering now for at least three decades of war, rape, massacres, and starving. So thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about this, the most neglected crisis in the world. Really, um, I can say that women I'm treating and healing at Panzi are my big inspiration. I could never go on without all the women I'm treating because when I can see their way to act, most of them when they're coming at the hospital, they are completely destroyed physically and mentally. And uh, sometimes myself I'm asking, even if I make an operation, what will be the future when they are incontinent? Where they, they have the, their genital completely destroyed? Rape in front of their husband, their own children, their community. But what is touching me is when women wake up, they are not wake up for themselves. And uh, I can say, I'm so touching to see that after some operation, women are asking me not what will be my future, but asking me where are my children? Did my children got food? Did my children went to school? And for me, this is really something it's giving me hope to see that even if women are suffering, they're still thinking about others. And uh, I can just say what I'm trying to do is very small if I can compare to what women are doing for the society, how women are supporting society. So to bring just my piece of prison but the one who is ready doing the prison are women and 
I can just admire them and thank them for what they are doing for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Mukwege, you, you live and work uh, in a rough neighborhood. I've been to your country, and I'm interested in finding out from you if after you won the Nobel Prize, uh, did that cast a protective cocoon around you, do you think, in a visible way? And because it now trains more attention on your work at Pansy Hospital, uh, has that meant more resources, more protection, and perhaps even more encouragement for yourself? Yeah. Um, after winning the Nobel Peace Prize, of course, I got a platform, and um, I was invited in many places to talk about the conflict related to sexual violence. But there is one thing, is that the cries of Congo, as I said, is forgotten and neglected. And uh, if we can follow the um, Norwegian Refugee Committee, who is ranking the cries around the world, there is three criteria. The first is the political will. You can see that in Democratic Republic of Congo, I can say there is no will to end the war. When it started in 1996, I was the medical doctor in, in the Mera Hospital. My patients were killed in the hospital. My staff was killed. And I try really to bring awareness on this question because for me, it was not acceptable. I could never think that patient can be killed in their bed or the staff who is trying to save life can be killed in doing their job without any consequence. But it happened. Yes. And in total impunity. So this lack of political will because this is a crime against humanity. It's a war crime. But it went with, with total impunity. But also, today we can see. Now, the UN is pulling out the Congo during the war of aggression. So to pull out when there is a war there is aggression. You can see all this camp. It's not the camp that happened years. People are still in this camp. So my big question is, where is the will? Because when you pull out, the UN pull out, when we are under a class of aggression, how the civil population will be protected? So I think that you can see that there is not really a will, and I'm, I'm worried about the international law, uh, international law and humanitarian law, because I have the impression that no one cares about what will be our world without law. Yes. If everyone can do what he wants, it's it will be a chaos. And when my patients were killed, I just got the impression that it was a special case. But now it happened in Syria. Hospital is bombed. It happened in Ukraine. And now in Gaza. So I can say that really we need really to push a political will so the law can be um, enforced. Thanks. Thank you very and uh, the second criteria is that the humanitarian aid. Yes. On the beginning of this year, the World Food Program make an appeal for 2,600,000,000 to support all these refugees 
we have seven million of people who are internally displaced in Congo. 25 million of people are starving. And when they make the appeal, in April this year, they got only 16% of what they need to feed all this population living in the camp. It means that they have to make priority who will get food and who will just die. And this is sad. And the last things, all the crisis around the world, every day you can know exactly what is happening in Ukraine, in Gaza. Who is talking about Congo? No Sudan. No one. So we are completely forgotten, and this is the situation. Even if I win the Nobel Peace Prize at the hospital, it's a big problem to get the means to support the victims. But what, thing, what I can say, outside Congo, we create, in, 19, in 2019, I start with a global survival fund to support women around the world because I just saw that everywhere where there is, women are suffering, they need the reparation to be able to go to justice. So we create this global survival fund to support women so they can get an uh, interim reparation before to get justice and get the reparation. But with this global organization, this organization is well-funded, mm -hmm. but we are living in a neglected crisis, so the funding is really... Dr. Uh, Mukwege, I hope it's clear to you that your presence here and uh, the support of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative and its many uh, affiliates and associates means that you are not alone and you will not be alone. Thank so you. Thank it's you. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. I, uh, I'll state the obvious here. A lot has to go wrong for you to have quite so much to do, as we saw. And you've described just now to us the heartbreaking trade-offs that are happening in the world, in your country, and in other regions. What I'd like to hear about is looking ahead. You mentioned the law. You mentioned a few other uh, approaches. How can the international community band together to affect lasting change in this space and how we respond to sexual violence and prevent it? Yeah, uh, uh, we, we launch <coughs> a red line mm -hmm. against the conflict related to sexual violence. And uh, this initiative is really to bring our world to understand that the way that women are treated in all conflict now after what happened in Israel and Gaza, we know that it's happening everywhere. So we can't say that maybe it will not happen in our country or in our region. We know that it's happening everywhere. So what we need to do is really to draw a red line so everyone can understand that in the war, women and children must be respected and protected. And this red line have four points. First is to prevent. And for to prevent, we need to create a framework to prevent against sexual violence in conflict. And this is, must be done on the international level, the national level, and on the community's level. So everyone can understand that this is not acceptable for uh, in our community to rape or to destroy children during the war. The second sense is to give a response. Women need to get a response. When we are not able to protect them during a war, we have responsibility to respond. And to respond is to give them the holistic care. And this holistic care is a medical treatment, so, uh, psychological support to support them, to reintegrate them in the community, socioeconomic support, and when they need to go to justice. It's our responsibility to support them, and states have this responsibility 
to support women when they want to go to justice. And for women to go to justice is not because they want only to see the perpetrators uh, to be uh, in prison. Most of the time, it's a process of healing. And in this process of healing, justice is very important because justice is just giving women this um, uh, feeling that I'm victim and the community accept what happened to me. So the response must be holistic. The third thing is justice and accountability. Today, many states can just commit this crime or let their population, women and children, to be raped without any consequence. So we need really not only to punish the soldiers, but we need to get the state to be accountable and all the high level leaders need to respond when it's happened. And there is a way. If you can say, if a leader in a country, he didn't protect his population, or he used rape as a weapon of war, just to tell him you can't be in the international community meetings, or you can't get the red carpet. But it's a shame to see that people who are letting the population to be raped, to be destroyed, getting red carpet in a country where we can say there is democracy is a shame. And the last thing that we, we, we can do, we can't really support women without reparation. And the reparation can be symbolic, it can be collective or individual, but we need to do this reparation to give all victims of sexual violence to understand that the community support them. Thank you very Thank much. You. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dennis Mukwege. Thank you all for joining us this morning, uh, for your attention, for your presence, for your support, for your encouragement. We hope that by listening to uh, our laureates, you also leave this place inspired to further action uh, and to the support of the work and the continuing legacies of these magnificent human beings who show us the way forward. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> I just want to briefly echo my colleague, Dele, and just thank you all for being here. And as we conclude, I'm really reminded of how there's immense power in our collective action of working together and the profound impact we can have on our world. And at the Promise Institute, we are committed to coming alongside and being directed and led by impacted communities in our work to advance the rights of all individuals around the globe. So your engagement with us today is really inspiring. Um, it pushes us to work harder and reach further in our efforts. And I just encourage each of you today as you engage in conversations this afternoon during our breakouts um, to carry forward the spirit of what you've heard by our inspiring uh, humanitarians and nominees this morning. Um, continue to advocate, continue to educate, and let's continue to support the causes that you've heard about today. Thank you. And I'll close us out by saying, as we started with, Dennis, Abduhadi, Nasreen are some of the best of humanity. Together, they are lights in the darkness, and combined with Aurora Humanitarians around the room, people giving of themselves every day to help others, they form a powerful, a beautiful constellation. And it's on us, my team at Aurora, but now it's on all of us to help the rest of the world see that constellation clearly. We started off with Nubar saying that this room are, are delegates, you're representing coalitions behind you. Help people see this constellation of humanitarian heroes. One way that we're doing that I'm excited to announce is that this week we've launched a website called Aurora Luminaries, it's auroraluminaries.com. It's a sister site to the core Aurora site and what it is, is it's a directory. 
of the last nine years of humanitarian stories that we've collected. You heard uh, Lord Darcy mention over 700 nominations this past year, but that's been going on since for nine years. And so we pulled together nearly 100 humanitarian stories from shortlisted Aurora humanitarians. There you're able to navigate by geography, by cause, by occupation, and really get to know this incredible network. We've hopefully made it a bit easier to find. You'll see these cards around. This is Dr. Tom Katina, our 2017 laureate, is unable to be with us today because he's in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan, or as I'm sure you all know, uh, their escalated violence again. There's a code you can scan on the back. It'll take you straight there. And so I encourage you to get to know this network online, but critically in person here. We're going to wrap up in just a moment. What we're going to show is a quick video on the cumulative impact of all of these humanitarians over the last several years, kind of what Aurora, the Aurora community has done together. So thank you very much. The Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity is the flagship program of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative that seeks to address humanitarian challenges around the world. The prize is a global humanitarian award that recognizes and supports individuals who put themselves at risk to save the lives, health, or freedom of those suffering as a result of violent conflict and major human rights violations. Each Aurora Prize laureate is given $1 million and an opportunity to continue the cycle of giving by allocating the majority of their prize money to help the most destitute. This approach helps the initiative create a ripple effect that has impacted the lives of over 3.2 million individuals across 56 countries and territories facing war, displacement, conflict, persecution, and other humanitarian issues. Aurora exemplifies the concept of gratitude in action celebrating the power of the human spirit that compels one to act in the face of adversity for the benefit of others.